Greetings and welcome to part two of our uh, basic oscilloscope extravaganza. Uh, let's uh, get this one started right away with minimal gabbing and a maximum demonstration. Uh, for those of you who saw uh, part one, uh, this should look very familiar. Uh, the 0 0.5 volt square wave that's being generated right down here um, by uh, a little uh, signal generator within the oscilloscope. I've only got one probe connected, and that is the channel 1 probe. Let's do something uh, pretty sneaky here, and let's connect both probes to that uh, little um, output link right there uh, for our signal generator. Okay, now both probes are connected to the probe adjust little output stud here. And let's take a look at what we have on the scope. Well, I expected a square wave um, like we saw yesterday, but I really don't see it here. So let's go back and change some settings uh, to see if we can't get it to show us that nice uh, square wave that we got used to seeing. First off, let's be sure that both our probes are set to the 1x position. Next, because we know that the output here from our square wave generator is uh, 500 millivolts, Let's set both of our volts per division knobs to the 0.5 position. Okay, and lo and behold, I see a square wave appear on the screen. I'm not sure which probe that's coming from though, but look here, I have this set to channel 1. So that is the channel 1 probe image, and channel 2 is not even shown. Let's go over to channel 2. Well, there it is down there. Now, you know with your position knobs, this is the one for channel 2. This is the one for channel 1. We can move these anywhere we want. Now, I'm going to move this one down a little. Then I'm going to go back to channel 1. And let's see, I'll move this one. Uh, just down, say a tad more. Now, we see them individually. Channel 1, Channel 2. Let's put the little sliding switch in the middle and let's look at both of them. Okay, so uh, we have here both our Channel 1 and Channel 2 square waves that are coming to us courtesy of our little square wave generator down here and through both our probes. As you know, Jack can hide better than any cat I've ever seen. But since the tape dispenser is hidden in my roll top desk, I have found that whenever he hears the noise of the roll top desk opening, he'll usually show up very quickly. Let's see. And here he is, just like clockwork. Coming in to eat the tape. Okay, now we have our two square waves, one above the other. One is from channel 1 and the other is from channel 2. Let's go over here to this switch that I asked you to trust me on where we put it in Alt. Let's put it to Add and see what happens. Look at that. The two uh, square waves add together. Put it back. We have 0 0.5 volts here. 0 0.5 volts here. We put it to add and uh, do a little adjustment and we have now two squares with it, which is one volt of deflection. So the uh, amplitudes from the two separate waves have added together into one wave. So that is the purpose of this position of the slide switch. Add. Let's go back to Alt and we have our two separate uh, square waves uh, channel 1 and channel 2 uh, restored. Now let's see how that channel 2 invert switch works. Remember we looked at it yesterday and just set it to norm. Okay, now, but before we do that, we're going to come over here to the source and switch to channel 1. Okay, so uh, we'll discuss this later, exactly why we're doing it, but we're going to say that our source then is channel 1. Now both channels are still here. Okay, but we switch to channel 1. Then we come over here and we'll say channel 2 invert. 
Watch that. Isn't that neat? You can flip it over upside down. Now, I hope you're thinking here because what do you think is going to happen if I try to add those two? Want to see? Zero. Why? Because plus 0 0.5 and minus 0 0.5 add up to zero. So uh, let's add them and they completely neutralize each other. Go back here to Alt. We see them separate. Let's go uh, over here then uh, on this switch and go back to Norm. And we see Channel 2 right side up. Now the best explanation I can give you over here uh, at this point is that by going to Channel 1, what I'm saying is Channel 1 is going to remain constant and whatever I do here is going to alter Channel 2. And that's what this button was able to do. If you don't isolate channel 1 and stay in the middle with vertical mode, as we have been, watch what happens when I say invert. It doesn't. It doesn't invert. Okay, so uh, as you can see, we have to go then to channel 1 if we want to have our channel 2 be invertible. Alrighty. Okay, I think it's time now to take a giant step over to the seconds per division knob. This will be our x-axis, which we know is time. And what this says to us, it's self-explanatory. How many seconds do you want each square moving on the x-axis, moving horizontally? Uh, how many seconds do you want each square to uh, equal? Well, first off, I think we need to know what our output signal is. Now, we've already looked down here to see that it is a 0 0.5 or 500 millivolts of amplitude for the square wave. But what is the frequency? Well, right under that, it says uh, that the frequency is 1 kilohertz, 1,000 cycles per second. So what we're seeing here represents 1,000 complete cycles per second. Now let's take a look at what one full waveform of this square wave looks like. It, we're going to start right here on the right hand uh, corner of this horizontal. I'm going to start here and I'm going to proceed until I get to exactly the same position which is right here on this waveform. So I'm going to go from start to finish. Therefore, from here to here is one full square wave form. Now to properly understand the seconds per division knob over here, I think it would be helpful to look at the screen and see how many square boxes there are along the x-axis from one edge of the screen to the other. And if we count them, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, that means there are 10 horizontal boxes across our screen. Now let's take an up close look at the seconds per division knob. And uh, as you'll see right here, uh, I can turn the knob so that various fractions of a second are going to be applied to each box. In this position, each box uh, will represent 0.2 milliseconds of time. If I crank all the way around here, each box is 2 milliseconds. If I come down here, each box is 50 milliseconds. Now, with that in mind, we need to look at our screen and figure out, just like on graph paper, what amount of time is going to be represented on my scope from far left to far right. In other words, 10 boxes across is going to equal how much time on my scope. Okay, let's set the seconds per division over here at 1 millisecond. That means for each 
horizontal box on my screen. Uh, each of the boxes then will represent one thousandth of a second of time. But I have ten boxes, right? So instead of one thousandth of a second from left to right of the screen, what will it be? One one hundredth of a second? Okay, think that over and try to get that straight. Remember, it's one millisecond per box. One millisecond, one millisecond, all the way across. That means from here to here represents ten thousandths of a second, which is the same as what? One one hundredth of a second? So, by setting one millisecond per box, I have a total of 10 milliseconds across, which is the same as one one hundredth of a second. So, are you with me right now that uh, it, uh, this screen represents then uh, the number of waves that are passing by in one one hundredth of a second? Now this is the square wave uh, that we get when we uh, set our seconds per division to one millisecond per box. What we're seeing here is the number of square waves that are passing across our screen every one hundredth of a second. Let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten square waves pass in one one hundredth of a second. How many square waves are going to pass in one second? It would be ten times a hundred or one thousand waves per second. That's the frequency then. One thousand waves per second or one kilohertz. And if we look down here at the output of our square wave we see it reiterates that we have 500 millivolts, but look at the frequency, 1,000 cycles per second, 1 kilohertz. In other words, our screen image showed us 10 complete waveforms in 1 one hundredth of a second, and therefore I know we have 1,000 waveforms in a full second. Now since the seconds per division knob has to do with frequency, I think this is the appropriate time to start talking about our audio frequency generator. We've been using the square wave that's generated by the oscilloscope up until now. Now let's move to an external source for our waveforms uh, and the uh, signal generator can generate both sine waves and square waves depending on the position of this button. Compared to the oscilloscope, operating an audio frequency generator is a cinch. Okay, we see here that we have a dial graduated from 10 to 100. Now, over here, we have multipliers times 1, times 10, times 100, times 1,000, times 10,000. That means that the range of frequencies that this can generate are from 10 times 1, or 10 cycles per second, all the way up to 100 times 10,000, which is 1 million cycles per second. So this simple device here can generate all the frequencies I can ever need or want. Um, also down here, think of this as a volume control. This is the coarse volume control. This is the fine volume control. We'll see on the scope how these affect the waveform that this generates, and you'll see what I mean. We'll use the coarse to get it into the ballpark and then fine tune it with this. Okay, if that all makes sense, then let's start looking at the scope and seeing what our waveforms look like. Okay, let's set it to sine waves, because we've seen enough square waves for a while, so that's this button out. And let's go here to 10 times 100, which means that we're going to get a thousand cycle per second sine wave, 
over here on our scope and I can control the amplitude of it coarsely and finely with these knobs. So let's take a look at the scope and see what we get. Okay, I have 10 times 100, which is 1,000 cycles per second up here on the scope. It's wiggling, but I don't really see a sine wave. So let's come back here to the attenuation and give it a little volume. Let's get some amplitude in our waveform. Okay, that might be a little too much. Okay, there's the course. You see the big jumps that happen with the course setting? And then I come over here to the fine, and I can fine tune it. Okay, so let's see if we agree that that looks like a thousand cycles per second. Well, let's see, since frequency is controlled by this uh, seconds per division knob, uh, it looks like we're still at the one millisecond setting that we had for the square wave. Now we said that that's one thousandth of a second per box. There's ten boxes, so that means that the full scan across the uh, entire scope screen is going to be a matter of one one hundredth of a second. So this represents the number of waves released from the frequency generator in one one hundredth of a second. Let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten waves were released in a one one hundredth of a second. But frequency is not measured in cycles per hundredth of a second. The definition of hertz is cycles per second. So uh, we have to correct this to reflect how many of these waves would have been encountered in a full second. And uh, since it's 10 in 1 one hundredth of a second, we'll multiply this number times 100 to find out how many waves would have been encountered in a full second, and it's 10 times 100, or 1,000 cycles per second, which is exactly the setting of the frequency generator, 10 times 100, or 1,000 cycles per second. Okay, so we see here we've got 10 times 100 gives us 1,000 cycles per second. In other words, 10 cycles per 100th of a second, which is 1,000 cycles per second. Let's change this to half that. Let's go to 500 cycles per second. I'm going to drop this down to 50 and I'm going to hit 10, which should give me exactly 500 cycles per second. Okay, I can position a little better here. Let's see how many waveforms we have. There's one, two, three, four, five complete waveforms. Well, wouldn't that make sense? Because five times one hundredth of a second means that in one full second time, five times a hundred waveforms would pass by, or five hundred cycles per second. Okay, let's run it down to 250 cycles per second. 25 times 10, 250 cycles per second. And we have here one, two, and a half waveforms. Uh, which is two and a half times a hundred is two hundred and fifty cycles per full second. Okay, we see that uh, as the frequency goes down, our scope image uh, stays exactly as we would expect. Uh, let's go the other direction. Let's go way up to not a thousand cycles per second. Let's go to ten thousand cycles per second. Now, I'm going to move over here and focus in on the scope and let you see that, although it has a hard time focusing, that is a whole bunch of, it looks like the teeth of a comb, but that's a whole bunch of cycles per second, uh, okay? So I think what we need to do is let's alter the seconds per division knob and see if we can't uh, kind of spread this out by giving 
uh, less and less time to each box, okay, so that uh, it takes more boxes and, and we spread out the waves so that we can actually count the waveforms. Okay, now I'm going to make a wild guess here. If the number of waveforms is 10 times greater now than it was, remember we could count them at a thousand cycles per second, we could count 10 waveforms. Now I've gone up by a factor of 10 to 100,000 cycles per second. How about if I reduce my seconds per division by a factor of 10 and I go from 1 millisecond all the way down to 0.1 millisecond. Let's see what the scope has to say about that. Okay, now this is what we had on the scope when we were at 1 millisecond. You see, there's so many waveforms we can't count them. Now, as we just calculated, I'm going to go to one-tenth that time interval. I'm going to click over here to 0.1 millisecond, and look what happens. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 waveforms. But remember that from here to here now is only one-tenth of the distance. It's one one-thousandth of a second from here to here. So I multiply this number, 10, times the one-thousandth of a second to correct that to one second would be times 1,000. I then would have 10,000 of these waveforms per second. If the screen were wide enough where I could show a full second, there would be 10,000 of those showing. Okay, now for fun, let's crank it up to 20,000 cycles per second. Look over here, and there, uh, I'm not going to take the time, but there's 20 waveforms showing. Remember then, this is one thousandth of a second from here to here. So I multiply the number of waveforms times a thousand to correct for this uh, width, and I end up with 20 thousand cycles per second. Let's see what 25 looks like. Still, you can still count them. 30. Let's go up to 50,000. It's getting a little snug in there now. It would be difficult to count, but there's 50 times 1,000 cycles per second. Do you see then how this works and how the waveforms appear on the scope and how we can adjust this knob to change the time factor on the horizontal axis to, in effect, magnify so we can actually count the number of waveforms or minify if we wish. So this right here then helps us fine-tune the scope to match the frequencies that are being fed into it. Now, for those of you who would prefer a mathematical way to calculate the frequency based on the number of waves that you see on the scope screen, then this equation will work. It's 1 divided by the number of squares on the screen, which will almost always be 10, times the setting and the seconds per division knob. If it's 1 millisecond, you enter that value as a decimal a fraction of, of a second, 0.001 or 1 one thousandth of a second. Do the multiplication, then the division, you'll get the correction factor. Then it's this correction factor times the number of waves on the screen will equal the frequency. If you saw 10 waves on the screen, then the frequency is 1,000 cycles per second. Jack's favorite prey is the Wiley pipe cleaner. And the gaudier they are, the better he likes them. Right, Jack? So, this will be the key to one other noise we make that brings him out of hiding. He somehow discovered that we keep the pipe cleaners in this utility drawer. So if you want Jack to show up, all you have to do is open the drawer, and there he is stalking his favorite prey. And there you have it, a very happy kitty. 
Okay, uh, let's have a little test now to gauge your uh, level of understanding. I have this scope image. There are 15 waveforms from this side of the scope to this. And if you notice, the amplitude of the waveform from the x-axis is three squares tall. The image is from channel 1. The probe is set to X1, and the volts per division are 0.5 volts per division. Look over here at our, uh, our uh, x-axis, and the time interval is 0.5 milliseconds per division. 0.5 milliseconds per division and 0 0.5 volts per vertical block the probe is at X1. Your question is what is the frequency of this waveform? Okay, stop the video for a while if you'd like to do some uh, figuring and then we'll restart and answer the question. All right, let's start off with the easy part. If the volts per division is set to 0 0.5 volts per square and the waveform is three uh, squares tall, then we can say that the waveform is varying between plus and minus 1.5 volts or three volts peak to peak since there are six squares. Now also we should mention now that scopes do not translate the voltage readings into RMS like multimeters do. So these are not RMS measurements. Now for the frequency calculation we know that our correction factor is 1 over the number of squares horizontally across the screen which is always 10 with this screen and I told you that we had set the uh, seconds per division knob at 0 0.5 milliseconds which is the same as 0 0.0005 seconds. We multiply 10 times this and we get 0 0.005 into 1 goes 200 times. That's our correction factor, 200 times the number of waveforms on the screen is 15. Therefore, our frequency of this waveform is 3,000 cycles per second. If you get the right answer, give yourself a much deserved pat on the back. Now as the final topic in this video, I'd like to discuss the trigger portion of the oscilloscope. Now without the triggering capability of our oscilloscope, this is what we'd see, which is really a bunch of nonsense. It's waveforms flying by so quickly that you really can't analyze them. The uh, one great ability here would be if we could stop the waveform, freeze it on the screen, and then count the number of waveforms per time interval, see how tall they are to see uh, the voltage uh, that's implied by their amplitude, but we really can't. So we have to come up with a way to freeze the waveforms in place on the screen. The closest analogy to this I can think of it would be a strobe light. If you remember in my strobe video I was able to stop that spinning of the disc that was going at uh, what a thousand RPM or so so that we could actually read a message that was written on it. So in a way this is sort of like that but instead of using visible light to freeze our waveforms we're going to use uh, time pulses that are being generated within the scope. Now exactly uh, all the details of how they're generated and how they work I think is beyond our need at this moment to fully understand. But let's just uh, keep it simple and say we're going to use whatever means necessary uh, to stop that image 
of waveforms so that we can study it. Now I'm going to back off here a little bit so that I can manipulate the controls over here and you'll see on the screen what the result is. Now here's why it can't uh, freeze the motion of the waveform because I told it that its source of triggering was external and then I connected no external trigger so it's aimless there it has no guidance okay so now let's flip this up now of the signal is coming in on channel one watch what happens when I tell it let's trigger on channel one how about that stopping the waveform dead in its tracks so that we can analyze it now there's a couple other controls here that I think we need to understand now and eventually uh, hopefully we'll understand all of them but let's look here at slope the little symbol to the left shows that the slope is rising and the one down here shows that the slope is dropping do I want to trigger on the rising portion of the slope if so, I'll put this in the upper position and look, it triggered right at the dead center of the rising portion of the slope. Let's now flip it down and we will be looking at the falling portion of the slope to trigger. So the scope then will be looking for a decreasing slope and using this level control we'll tell it what voltage we want it to trigger at and it will freeze that waveform for us to study if we go back to our ascending slope we see this image so for now let's just view the trigger portion of the oscilloscope as the means by which it will freeze the waveforms so that we can study them. We can adjust it in different ways and key it to the different uh, channels, uh, channel 1 triggering, channel 2 triggering, external, um, whatever it takes to give the scope the information it needs to be able to freeze the waveform. Now I'm going to zoom in here on the controls so that you can set yours on your scope to repeat this experiment. Okay, I've got the slope in the ascending form. I have the mode over here at TV line. And if you want to have your uh, scope image be zooming across, drop all the way down to line. And since you have no line input, the, uh, there is no guidance as to the um, triggering. Go back up to channel 1 and you will get our nice frozen image okay I hope that makes good sense well that's about it for this part 2 of the oscilloscope video extravaganza I hope you enjoyed it and I hope it made I again want to extend my heartfelt thanks to all the pat patrons on patreon who have uh, made generous pledges and to all the uh, people who have made contributions through PayPal. Because of you, we'll keep forging on here, uh, cranking out videos, and avoiding the inclusion of any annoying advertising. To the rest of you viewers, if you would like to join in uh, and become a patron or PayPal uh, contributor, I will include links in the video description to help you do so. I'm sorry I don't have any uh, more hot rod uh, videos for you as you saw in the last installment the car show ended uh, but I intend to find more in the very near future. Meanwhile I want to get you excited about the isolation transformer construction video. Uh, the construction of it's simple enough but what I'm really excited about is after it's built to go through and test it thoroughly to see just how safe uh, it, it is uh, if you plug in an amplifier to it. Are there any places in that amplifier that still retain ground reference? Uh, if you run a ground from the primary of the isolation transformer to the output socket 
for your amp? Does that undo the isolation? I've heard so many uh, crazy assertions and wives tales here lately that I'm going to put them all to rest by doing a thorough testing of a real honest to God isolation transformer and we're going to find out the truth. If that appeals to you, then please stay tuned.